Right, okay, so we'll just see if some other people might join us um, in a little while, but a very well welcome to you all um, for this PGT recruitment session um, on the courses that we do in archaeology. Um, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues, um, Ian Banks from the Conflict Archaeology and Heritage Programme and Dr Michael Given um, from Archaeology, who is the convener for the Archaeology Programme. Um, I'm Nairi Finlay um, and I'm the convener for the Material, Culture and Artifact Studies Programme and I'm also overall Archaeology um, postgraduate convener um, this year for Archaeology. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, share my screen with you. I've got some images just to run through a short presentation and then we'll hear from Ian and Michael and then we'll have opportunity for questions as well and a bit of chat. If you've got questions too, use the chat function um, on the webinar as well because we can answer some questions um, hopefully as we go um, and also pick up on some general points um, using that as well just for general kind of queries. Um, and things too. So without further ado, I'm going to share my um, screen with you um, and we'll um, get going. Okay, so archaeology at Glasgow, um, where to start really in terms of um, the programmes that we offer. Um, we've got three um, programmes um, that we run under the aegis of archaeology, um, and you'll hear from the conveners um, of those um, today. But I'd like to start really by just giving you a few introductory, um, I guess, an introductory welcome to Glasgow and also to highlight a number of things um, about the university and also our programmes and our experience um, in postgraduate um, teaching. So why Glasgow? And I think the question would be why not Glasgow um, and making Glasgow your destination um, for your postgraduate research. Um, Glasgow um, is um, Scottish University of the Year um, and is also um, a highly ranking university in terms of the world ranking and also generally in the top 10 um, universities in the UK um, for ex our um, teaching and our research practice. Um, we put a lot of store and um, colleagues in the department in our um, attention to our kind of teaching practice and, um, and also um, staff have won teaching awards um, for their um, work, uh, working with um, a number of students. Um, our department in Glasgow is also one of the largest um, in Scotland and it's really um, the key department for working on the archaeology of Scotland, um, and as well as taking a bigger global perspective um, on archaeology um, and heritage. Um, and I'll introduce um, some of those and highlight some of those areas um, to you shortly. I think there's also other advantages to being based in Glasgow as well um, for a postgraduate degree. Um, those are also ones to do um, with the resources within Glasgow itself um, as a city, um, fabulous museums, including the new borough collection that's opened um, through Glasgow Life. Um, we're also conveniently located um, and a short train journey away from the other resources of the National Museum and National Archives and other resources um, within Edinburgh, as well as having a number of those within the city itself. Um, and we're also very well placed to enable the exploration of Scotland and um, within a couple of hours from Glasgow you can be sitting on one of the islands, you can be up in the highlands um, exploring um, the natural world and scenic wonders of what Scotland has to offer um, very easily and also Glasgow itself is a very convenient transport hub for accessing Europe um, and further afield um, as well. So there's a lot of um, locational benefits to being in Glasgow um, as well as um, intellectual ones um, too. It's a lively and dynamic city um, renowned for its music um, and, and its culture um, and a very warm welcome uh, as well. So our subject area um, within archaeology sits within the School of Humanities um, and some of our colleagues including um, Ian and Professor um, Tony Pollard um, are within the history department where there are also other um, archeologists um, on staff. We have a number of close connections with the other subject areas within the School of Humanities and also 
um, working relationships with other departments uh, across the university. Um, and our staff cover a range of periods um, from early prehistory um, all the way up to the contemporary. Um, our key research areas are in a number of separate um, areas. We'll hear a little bit more about the um, conflict um, and heritage um, programme shortly. Um, but we have strains in digital archaeology, engaged archaeology, where we're very interested in how archaeology um, fits with the contemporary world um, and our responsibilities um, in, with relation to um, archaeology um, and heritage. We also have strengths in landscape, and we'll hear a bit um, about his research a bit later on, um, and landscape studies um, and regional specialisations that range um, from Scotland and Northern Europe all the way through the Mediterranean and into Kurdistan um, and the Middle East, uh, as well as um, further afield. Another key strength that we have is in um, material culture and artifact studies. Um, with several specialists on the staff, and I'll say a wee bit, a bit more about that um, in a moment. Um, and also areas of, um, in, in terms of um, environmental research um, and landscape reconstruction, um, and how archaeology um, can contribute to some of the global challenges that we face around climate change, um, and also um, apply new techniques and new methodologies and bring those to the table in terms of our um, approaches and our analysis. So we're quite a lively um, department with um, a whole range of different um, staff, each with specialisms and many of whom um, actively teach and contribute research-led teaching um, to our postgraduate programmes. In archaeology, um, we look at um, our master's provision as well as um, delivering undergraduate degrees in archaeology and in um, a number of joint subjects and also um, with our um, postgraduate research um, students um, doing PhDs within the department. Um, our master's programmes um, are in three um, key areas. And I thought it would be worth just highlighting um, the master's by research or the research degrees because information about those is to be found not necessarily in the um, web pages around the top programmes, but on the postgraduate um, research pages. Um, and they may also be interest um, to people applying um, as well, who are maybe thinking um, about more of a, a research career trajectory or where you've already identified areas for um, specialisation um, and possible um, research focus. So we'll hear a wee bit from each of the conveners around our three programmes. But I just wanted to highlight um, this Masters by Research as well, which also has an element of top postgraduate modules that you take um, between 60 um, and 80 credits, which translates to usually around three to four top courses um, during the first and second semester before moving on to a more substantive research dissertation, um, which can be up to 30,000 words. And, and the size and length of the research dissertation um, expands um, in relation to the, the number of um, top credits, so you can do less or more top credits in um, the courses. But this is a, a, a good choice for people that maybe have already identified a clear um, research um, area of specialism who want to benefit from the background um, and um, structure of the top postgraduate modules, um, as well as focus on a substantive bit of, of um, research. But because it's a research degree, it's considered under the research and, um, you know, within the research degrees. And some people, if you're just reading over some of the postgraduate literature for top programmes, you might actually um, not really be aware that that's an option for you in terms of a one year full time um, programme in terms of a research um, by masters. And again, quite happy to take questions and things on that um, as we move forward, you know, towards the end um, as well. But our top postgraduate programmes are really there to develop and help people transition from being learners into researchers, from using that um, year as an opportunity to develop and build um, on a set of professional skills and a, of, um, 
both with new learning um, and learning in depth around issues and, the, and, and additional complexity of issues than perhaps have been encountered during um, an undergraduate degree programme. We also have quite a lot of people on our master's programmes who are coming back um, to do study, having spent time um, as in either archaeology or heritage um, as professionals and who are looking for um, further qualifications to think about advancing their careers, perhaps looking ahead to doing a PhD in postgraduate, other postgraduate research, and also to um, really cementing um, and building on um, the foundations of specialist experience um, to perhaps specialise in particular areas or also to broaden maybe some of their horizons from their undergraduate degree. And top master's programmes um, differ in that um, you are transitioning from a position of learning into one of research. Um, we support that movement through into your professional practice and also the participation in this academic community through um, activities like weekly seminar series where we have invited speakers to um, share their knowledge of um, new research, um, as well as um, seminars and other presentations that are done by staff members on their own active research projects. We also have um, the opportunities for students to participate in workshops um, and conferences um, that the, the department put in place and also to, to benefit from um, other, um, the wider research community um, in a Scottish context, and also ones where um, the social side of that and networking is facilitated by participation in things like the Archaeology Society, um, Student Society, which is very active, um, and also other organisations um, within um, Glasgow um, and Scotland, like the Glasgow Archaeological Society, um, a learned society that's been um, running for over 100 years, and also the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland as well, um, who also um, deliver um, lecture programmes, um, excursions and other activities as well that can support um, people's um, learning um, and development um, through the master's year um, as they um, go forward. At Glasgow, we put a lot of attention to on, on working with you to develop your graduate attributes. Um, all these um, skills that you need to acquire to be nimble in and look ahead in terms of professional practice in the workplace um, to prepare you for um, a, a diverse array of um, potential employment um, and also to, to develop those personal skills that are integral to um, success um, during your year with us um, and also moving on um, into the workplace. So very much looking at, at, at the skills around making you subject specialists in your particular area of um, helping develop those critical and independent learning skills, communication skills, um, and also collaboration um, in ethical and socially aware um, practices. Um, and I think um, our sort of subject area ethos is very much one of a more reflexive um, and engaged um, learning around how we all see these attributes developing um, and continuing in our professional practice um, as we go forward. So I want to say a little bit about um, Material Culture and Artifact Studies um, as a programme that's been um, running at Glasgow for the last 16 years and a little bit drilled down a little bit into some of the information for the individual programmes. And I guess I'm exploiting um, my um, position as chair to um, kick off with material culture um, and artifact studies. Um, art, this is a programme um, that we designed um, and set up really to address um, learning and the need for archaeological specialists, both in terms of finds, but also to prepare people for a range of um, future employability within the archaeological sector and also the museum sector um, in relation um, to dealing with um, material culture um, and individual artefacts. Um, and the programme um, is taught by myself and colleagues, um, including Susanna Harris, who works on um, ancient textiles and um, she's been doing some fantastic projects around must farm which is a um a bronze age 
village, which has um, a very high degree of organic preservation. And she's been um, looking at this, doing the specialist analysis on Bronze Age textiles um, from England. Um, She's also leading up a project um, with the National Museum of Scotland around a fantastic Viking hoard, the Galloway Hoard, um, which has this amazing um, array of, um, of treasure, but also some really fantastic preserved um, textiles um, associated with that. Um, and Susanna heads up our, one of our core modules um, in the programme, the process of artifact um, studies. Other colleagues, such as our postdoctoral fellow, um, Lisa Campbell in the centre here, um, is working is a, on um, Roman um, pigments and paintings using um, advanced scientific techniques to really explore um, the paint and decoration of milestones associated with the Antonine Wall. Um, Lisa is also an expert in um, Roman ceramics um, and along with some other early career researchers um, are also um, really focusing on archaeological assemblages um, and um, the way in which we can kind of um, approach these, asking new questions of old materials and applying new techniques. Um, my own research um, has um, is focused um, on lithic technologies. Um, my background is in prehistory, but I've been doing work up into the contemporary um, era, era looking at um, archaeological collections. I'm interested in how um, people, um, archaeologists, um, particularly vocational archaeologists, learn um, to catalogue and document their collections. And one of my articles on the archaeology of dementia has just been published um, and is the front cover of Antiquity this month um, as well. So my lithic work um, spans sort of prehistory um, to the present and these ways in which the emotive um, and the um, sensorial can are ways that we can kind of connect um, the into some of the other meanings of, of material culture, um, as well as um, asking new questions and new ways that we can approach um, some of the um, material, including some legacy excavations. So the Bronze Age urn that you see there is one of our ongoing projects to address some um, outstanding excavations from the 1960s and the 19, up to the 1980s um, and um, break, take these out to the local community um, and um, engage them um, and celebrate some of those archaeological findings um, and, and see those published. So just a little overview of the course structure um, for material culture because it does differ from some of our other, other programmes. Um, the first semester we look at three core modules, um, the second semester from um, January um, to um, spring vacation, um, students take three options from a set of options. And the final assessment um, is um, either a dissertation or um, on this programme, a sort of vocational strand that looks at work placements um, and um, other research. Um, so just to kind of um, capture that in a little bit more detail for you, our core modules look at sort of theoretical approaches to material culture. We look at issues around materiality um, and um, object diaspora um, and itineraries. Um, we look through the process of artifact studies at the biography of archaeological objects through the cycle of excavation, um, curation processes, all the care and attention um, and specialist studies of those um, right through to their display and their presentation in museum contexts and research and professional skills tools people up in these um, generic um, skills that they need in terms of um, communicating of engaging with current research um, and other considerations um, within um, the profession at the moment. Um, as, as a sort of, sort of core modules in first semester before moving into specialized options um, in se second semester, which are focused on um, uh, assemblage work, various period um, and regional specializations. Um, and also an independent study module that can be a very flexible module to tool up individuals to perhaps test out um, approach to, approaches to certain types of methodologies or 
um, regional archaeologies, um, often working with mentors and, and on pra more practical analytical um, skill sets as well. So the independent study module can also be a good one um, to try out and see whether or not research interests are there um, and, and also pre help prepare um, students for dissertations. On the Material, Culture and Artifact Studies programme, um, as well as the option of doing a, a, a dissertation as a focused piece of independent research, um, we have a vocational pathway which involves a work placement, which is assessed by an e-portfolio e in Mahara, um, and um, the option of doing a research report or an exhibition design. And the research report can take the form of a mock journal article. It can be a small specialist style um, report um, or a mini dissertation on an artifact or a, or a particular assemblage. Whereas the exhibition design students have worked on um, putting on virtual exhibitions um, display cases um, or indeed um, developing proposals for museums um, in a number um, of different uh, contexts. Oops, sorry, I'll just go back there. So our vocational path where students do um, a substantive work placement um, during um, the summer, um, they spend up to six to eight weeks working with one or more um, providers. Um, those providers come from um, the ar archaeological companies, so professional units. We've had people doing finds work up in Orkney, working um, with local um, archaeological companies like Guard Archaeology Limited, um, on a set of projects um, or looking at post excavation um, developing their own specific skill sets. So you'll see some examples from a student e-portfolio here where a um, student has been working on developing illustration techniques and skills um, and 3D modelling of artefacts. Um, and others have contributed to um, national um, reviews of um, and status applications for local museums. Across the central belt, we've had students working with Shetland Museum on displays, um, Western Isles, National Museum of Scotland and other providers. And we work with students to, to really focus and identify your individual learning outcomes and how you can then take those forward um, with a provider um, on a specific um, set of projects um, or, in, or discrete um, tasks um, as part of, of that portfolio. And um, we found over the years that this has been a really effective way for students to um, demonstrate those skill sets when they're going on in terms of future employability, because um, the e-portfolio can also serve as an ECV for students um, to demonstrate their skills. You can upload videos, examples of spreadsheets, for example, um, photographs of you um, taking part in certain and demonstrating um, core skill sets and, and the analysis of um, artifacts and other material. Um, and this has really helped students um, in terms of their um, employability as they've moved forward. And indeed, a number of students have went on to do PhDs, work in academia, um, work as specialists, um, and also work um, in commercial heritage environments and for a range of museums across the UK, Europe um, and um, North America uh, as well. So I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to um, stop my share there um, and come out of this um, and um, pass over um, to Ian Banks um, as convener for Conflict Archaeology um, and Heritage to say a bit about um, that programme. Ian. Right, well, Conflict Archaeology and Heritage, um, as Nairi's already told you, we are kind of positioned between archaeology and history. Uh, teaching it are uh, Tony Pollard, and myself, and we're both of us people who started off as archaeologists and for uh, a variety of uh, reasons ended up in uh, history. But what we do is we teach archaeology to history and uh, history to archaeologists. So uh, um, yeah, it's it's been a, a long, strange road. Uh, we do tend to uh, um, focus very much on the historic era um, and what we do in many ways can be regarded as historical archaeology, um, which fits in with a lot of things that uh, the archaeology uh, subject area does. Um, but uh, we 
have a background in prehistory, so we understand, um, you know, the, the the full gamut of uh, uh, things that uh, um, are done. Now, we set this course up in um, when was it about 2006, I think, and it started off as a battlefield archaeology um, program, and it's now developed into conflict archaeology and heritage. It's not something where you need to be a, uh, an archaeologist, um, because one of the things that we concentrate on in uh, first semester is courses that teach you about where the data comes from, um, how does that data get recorded, um, what does it consist of, how do we interpret it, and that kind of thing. So by the time that you get into second semester, you should all be on the, the same page. Um, the way that the course is constructed is that we have uh, three core courses in first semester, one of which is the same archaeology uh, research skills course that everybody else does. So you'll be mixing with people from the other programmes uh, while you do that. Um, and then the other two are, as I say, they're focused on um, the sort of the nuts and bolts of archaeology and giving you an introduction to uh, what conflict archaeology is all about. In second semester, we do we've got two optional courses, and you've got to choose three courses between um, the the range of archaeology courses and history courses that are out there. Um, we suggest, for your own benefit, that you do two of ours. You know, you take the two optional courses that we've got on offer, um, but you don't have to. Um, but certainly there are advantages to, you know, keeping on doing what we do. But it does mean that you can opt to choose some of the uh, the more vocational um, courses that archaeology offers and things like GIS or, or things like that. Um, and a lot of people do that. So, uh, you know, we are pretty flexible in the way the, the whole thing runs and we, we do work very closely with uh, um, our archaeology colleagues. Once you've completed the first two semesters, what you have left to do is a dissertation, uh, 15,000 words. Uh, you will have been thinking about this and being encouraged to think about this all the way through semesters one and two. And uh, this is a piece of fundamental research which you'll be um, undertaking and people do a wide range of topics they do things on material culture they do things on uh, monumentality they do things on um, uh, weaponry they do things on uh, some of them do fieldwork based ones and so on so there's a really wide range of things that you can you can go for um, and we'll be supporting you through uh, first and second semester, getting to terms with what it is that you want to uh, look at. And then once you've uh, looked at those things, um, and once you've decided what you're going to be doing, then we will support you through the uh, the writing of it and make sure that what you produce is uh, um, tip top, basically. Uh, so that's the structure of the course. So what, what do we actually do in the course? Well, um, as I say, I've, I've been throwing around terms like battlefield archaeology and conflict archaeology. These are very different things and they are not interchangeable. Battlefield archaeology is the archaeology of a battlefield and its landscape context. So we're talking about places like Little Bighorn or Culloden, you know. Um, and it's very much about the battles themselves, and it's about where people were and what uh, got dropped, what the patterns of distribution are of the artifacts and so on. And in this, the, uh, the, the subject is very much um, still grappling with ideas about uh, um, middle range theory and so on, um, trying to uh, establish how uh, valid the distributions are and what distributions mean, what can we actually tell from the artifacts and so on. It's a whole mess of things that you can do with that. Uh, conflict archaeology is um, a wider term. It's the overall subdiscipline within which battlefield archaeology sits. But what that then covers is, as in addition to the battlefield, it also 
um, a whole thing, a whole kind of wide range of things like military installations, it covers siege sites, civil unrest, industrial disputes, prison camps, um, occupation, uh, occupation contested landscapes, prehistoric warfare, you name it. You can basically cover it within conflict archaeology. One thing we talk about a lot and we deal with a lot is the metal detector because we are dealing with a different archaeology to most of our colleagues. Most of our colleagues are dealing with things that are buried below the ground for a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of them are plow, marks, uh, plow damage sites or uh, whatever. We're dealing with stuff that's actually in the topsoil that covers uh, the kind of archaeology that we used to deal with. So the metal detector is a, um, a fairly fundamental tool of ours. And this is, on the, the right hand side, this is a guy we worked with a lot. Um, he's a metal detectorist, an amateur, um, and he is an excellent metal detectorist and as mad as a box of frogs. But anyway, um, yeah, so metal detectors, we're here. Metal detectors, um, problem that we have is a lot of this is looting. It's uh, nothing more than that. People who uh, take a metal detector out and they are basically going out looking for goodies. And this is at uh, um, an American site, which has completely gone from my mind just at the moment. Um, but basically, this is a shop uh, next to the battlefield where you can buy all sorts of uh, relics from the battle which have been picked up by uh, metal detectorists and have been sold. In every case, their value as uh, archaeological artifacts has been destroyed by that process. How we avoid the problems of that kind of metal detecting, that kind of looting, is by taking account of context, where things are actually found, and making sure that we record that. And one of the things that we've done a lot of is trying to work with metal detectorists so that they understand that when they pull something out the ground, if they haven't recorded where it came from, um, and where it lies in relation to other material, um, they've basically destroyed that context. They've they've lost all the information from it, and you know we're we're really reduced in what we can actually find out from it. But in addition to things like being able to do the finds distribution maps, as you can see on the left hand side, on the right hand side, um, we uh, uh, we have. Uh, a very primitive version of the the sort of thing that can be done, which is that we can analyze the landscape in terms in terms of something like a, a view shed analysis, uh, get an idea of what a man on the ground could see, what somebody on a horse could see, what somebody in a certain bit of cover could see, and that kind of thing. You can do that on an individual basis, which has been done for Little Bighorn, um, or you can do it uh, on a more um, strategic level where you can see things like uh, when a line of approach actually comes in sight of the battlefield and so on. What we do is we emphasize very much that uh, recording context is absolutely critical and we talk about things like global positioning uh, systems and things like that. We are very interested in landscapes. Um, what you see there is uh, um, the landscape left after the First World War. That is the Loch Nagar mine crater uh, created by um, an enormous mine that was set off. And uh, we are very concerned about uh, getting to understand the way that the landscape impacts the events of the, uh, the day of battle. Um, because it really does matter to, uh, in terms of being able to understand why um, troops moved in a particular direction, um, what kind of decisions the uh, the commanders were making, what kind of information they might well have had, all that kind of thing. And then, of course, there are all sorts of uh, physical constraints that the con that the landscape actually puts onto um, the soldiers. We also get involved with uh, experimental work. Um, this is a, a three pound cannon that uh, was built by a former member of the uh, um, engineering department who was also an ex uh, member of the paratroop regiment. And uh, we provided the funding uh, for that. And uh, 
we've used it for some experimental work, but basically that travels around uh, um, around Europe, really, uh, taking part in uh, reenactments and so on. And uh, you have to experience being in close proximity when that goes off. It's it's one of these things where you hear the sound, but you actually feel the sound in your chest. Um, we also, when we can, uh, get students out to do live firing with muskets. We have a collection of muskets and a, uh, a Baker rifle. Um, the muskets are Brown Bess replicas and uh, when we can, we take people out to the, uh, the vet school. Um, they've got a farm out in the west and we can go and uh, shoot away um, out there. Can't always put it on, and for the past few years it's been impossible because of uh, COVID, but uh, we are trying to get that back on the, the, the go. We talk about cultural resource management as well. Um, cultural resource management, if you haven't come across the term before, it's how you actually deal with um, uh, the cultural resources, such as landscapes or sites, uh, buildings, um, flint scatters, whatever. Anything that exists in the landscape, how do you manage that? How do you manage to how do you manage to uh, uh, control what happens to it and uh, reduce the impact of uh, um, human activity on it? Um, we used to uh, get you to write management plans um, for specific battlefields, uh, but uh, we decided that that was. A little bit too much work so we don't do that anymore but we, we do a version of it the the thing about uh, the cultural resource management is that it's something we've been very intimately involved in over the years in scotland um and you heard that uh, um earlier on that you know that archaeology does uh, a lot of research-led teaching that's what we're all about um, we're all about research, research led teaching. So most of what you hear about is stuff from things that we've actually done. And in terms of the cultural resource management, uh, we were commissioned by the Scottish government to produce a, an inventory of the Scottish battlefields that are of uh, um, national significance, uh, which we did. And it's the it's you know a very um, influential element of uh, the planning process now. Um, so we know how these things come about. We know what goes on behind the scenes and we can give you that information. So you're coming to people who've actually done this, who uh, um, they can give you the, the inside story about uh, how things happen. The best thing about the course, or at least in my opinion, is the fact that we take you on field trips. You get two field trips in uh, first semester and two in second semester. These are attached to particular courses. Um, in first semester, I think these are Art of War. Um, and uh, in second semester, they will be under British battlefields. What we uh, have got here are four of the battles that we, uh, we visit. Um, in the top, Left hand corner, we have uh, the uh, the monument to the clans at uh, Culloden. So that is part of the Culloden battlefield. Um, that's on the uh, the Jacobite right flank. Um, it's near the centre, but slightly on the right hand side. And it was erected in the 19th century to commemorate the, uh, the dead of the battle. But it's also where the clan cemetery is, uh, where there are stones um, allegedly for the uh, the dead of the battle um, and uh, are assigned to specific clans. The top right hand side, that is Robert the Bruce sitting on his horse. Uh, that is at the Battle of Bannockburn. So we've gone from Culloden in uh, 1746 to the Battle of Bannockburn in uh, 1314. Um, and you can see students there gathered around. This is at the Bannockburn Visitor Centre. And uh, we'll take you there. We'll take you through the Bannockburn uh, Visitor Centre. Um, we will, um, as long as they've managed to get uh, things going, we will uh, help you with the playing of the, uh, the, the Bannockburn uh, war game. 
and we'll show you the battlefield itself, which is actually a little bit away from where the visitor center is. So we'll show you all of that. Bottom left, uh, we even go abroad. We go to uh, England and that is uh, Flodden uh, down in England. Um, that is from 1513 and it was a fairly uh, disastrous outcome for the Scots. They were up on the hill that you can see there. You don't really get a full picture of uh, quite how steep that hill is, but as they advanced down the hill, uh, they got bogged down in very boggy ground and uh, massacred by the English troops, who uh, they vastly outnumbered, and uh, King James IV of Scotland was killed in the fighting. So we take you there and we also take you to, uh, to Berwick, um, where we look at the uh, the, the massive defences that uh, were built at Berwick. Um, on the uh, the bottom uh, right, we have a view over the Battle of uh, Preston Pans, which is part of the Jacobite Risings. Um, this is from uh, uh, 1745. You'll see a whole mess of um, uh, Jacobite battles. Um, while we're there. Um, Culloden, uh, when we go and do that one, you also get to see uh, Killy Cranky on the way up, which is the first Jacobite battle at all. Um, and we will take you to other Jacobite uh, related uh, sites as well. Um, one of the things about uh, Culloden is that uh, um, Tony and I have uh, done field work there and uh, our field work has been uh, fairly influential in the way that the uh, uh, National Trust for Scotland now interprets the battle. So we take you on all of these. Um, it's an opportunity for you to get out and actually see Scottish uh, landscapes, to see Scottish battlefields, uh, to be out with your classmates and uh, spend time with them, spend time with us. It's all... Um, added value for the course and one of the things that we feel is that uh, you know if you're looking at um, battlefields and conflict in general one thing that Scotland has and this is feeding back to uh, Nairi's point about why Scotland um, uh, sorry why Glasgow we can reach all of these within uh, a few hours at most and uh, nobody else has them Nobody else has Culloden, nobody else has Bannockburn. So you have to come here to see those. So you might as well come here um, and do your uh, conflict archaeology masters here. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Michael Given. I'm mostly a landscape archaeologist. I work in historical periods, particularly in Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean and also in post-medieval Scotland. Now, the two programmes you've just heard about are fairly specific uh, in thematic terms. The MSc in archaeology is much broader, it gives you more flexibility, but still the opportunity to focus in or specialise on particular aspects that you're interested in. And the best way of explaining that is through the three strands. I'll just run through them and then give you a bit of an overview of how, how the programme works. So one strand that we offer is landscape archaeology, and that's mostly taught by me and Rachel Oppitz and Nikki Whitehouse. And uh, if you want to find more about what we do in our research, just look us up on our staff pages. Uh, so we do both the more technical aspects of landscape archaeology, for example, GIS and uh, environmental science. Uh, and we also do um, uh, theoretical uh, approaches to the landscape and the experience of the landscape uh, and so on. Here's just a few examples from Scotland and Cyprus, as it happens. These two here are Glencoe, and uh, as it happens, uh, uh, we're going there on Friday uh, with a group of landscape archaeology postgraduate students, both masters and uh, PhD students. Okay, so that's one possibility. Uh, then we also offer a specialist strand in digital archaeology. And again, we do uh, technical aspects, more creative aspects. So thanks to Rachel Oppitz, we do uh, uh, LIDAR and remote sensing. Uh, and we also do uh, 
more cre uh, creative uses of digital archaeology to do reconstructions, for example, the, the color on this, this um, uh, Pictish sculpted stone here, uh, and um, using digital methods and techniques to engage particular communities or museum goers or site visitors or whatever with digital ways of interpreting a landscape or a sculpture or a museum collection or whatever it might be. And I'll show you the specifics of the courses on offer in just a minute. And then the third strand is Celtic and Viking archaeology. Uh, this is uh, particularly in uh, the uh, British, um, uh, Britain and Ireland, Scandinavia and the, the North Atlantic. And this is mostly taught by um, Stephen Harrison, one of the co-authors of this very useful overview book uh, here, and uh, Stephen Driscoll. And so you can see, for example, uh, Iona, um, the work we did as part of a, a major research project a few years ago in Perthshire. This is a picture cemetery near Fotiviat in central Scotland. Um, and so we, we offer um, a range of um, uh, courses which will help you uh, get an overview, an introduction to, and then specialise in um, Celtic and Viking archaeology. So here's my attempt to sum it all up. This is essentially a list of courses, I should say a provisional list of courses. We're still uh, finalising this. And so um, as well as the research and professional skills compulsory course that uh, Ian and Irene have already mentioned, you do another five co courses. If you want to do one of these three strands I've just explained, you would probably choose at least two from each uh, of those. But there are a range of other courses as well that you see uh, up here. Um, uh, for example, West Asian, or you might know that as uh, Middle Eastern or Near Eastern archaeology and Mediterranean archaeology. Um, Feasting Like the Ancients co uh, covers the same area as well. You can take courses um, that you've just been hearing about from Ian and Myrie from uh, their programmes as well. And you, um, you can stray into other subject areas as well, as uh, Ian has already said. And as an example, I've just given you three from uh, a, a classics uh, that uh, you, know, you can choose. Okay, and um, then as both Larry and Ian have mentioned, um, there will be um, a, a dissertation, so a 60 credit uh, a dissertation. Okay, so that's a, a quick summary of the, the structure of the course. And as with uh, Nairi and Ian, um, I'll be happy to take any questions I might have. Thank you.